Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here today. I was involved in a lot of different conferences and meetings and organizations and field days throughout my career. But I can tell you the Alpha Alpha Conference was always extremely special. Uh, I've had a, a good experience going back and looking at 50 years. And I've observed two or three things while doing that. Number one, I have been amazed at how fast the last 50 years have passed. Number two, if I would have known throughout my career that someday I would be asked to talk about 50 years in alfalfa production, I would have taken a lot better notes over the years. Number three, I have made a lot of observations about alfalfa in the last 50 years, but my memory has started failing me pretty seriously, so I have forgotten a lot of those observations. So today, as I talk about this, if I make a statement or I say something you agree with and you like, consider that as a very astute observation. But if I say something you don't like or it's wrong or you disagree with, that's just a result of my bad memory. Now, I want to tell, say one other thing. I grew up in Ojai County, Kentucky. I grew up on the poor side of Ohio County, Kentucky, and I grew up on one of the poor farms on the poor side of Ohio County, Kentucky. As a result of that, we were usually about a decade behind the more progressive farmers in all of our operations. Now, I say that because I'm going to go back beyond 50 years. I'm going to go back over 70 years to my very earliest memories of, of haymaking. Basically, my earliest memories of haymaking was going to the field with my papa when I was a little boy and watching him cut patches of hay with a scythe, letting that dry, raking it up with a pitchfork and putting it in a shock. I remember when we got our very first McCormick Deering mowing machine, horse drawn. I remember our first dump rake. And I remember with, with fear and trembling an experience I had on that dump break as a little boy. And uh, John and Clayton, every time I tell this story, something gets bigger in it. But I was getting ready to dump a big load, a windrow of hay. And when I did, a giant black snake came up right on my legs. Now, every time I tell that story, that black snake gets bigger. For the sake of the story today, that black snake was 14.3 feet long. <laughs> but it was a scary experience. I can't show that slide without thinking about it. I remember hauling in loose hay, hauling it in, putting it up in the barn loft. Papa always had at least a five-gallon bucket up there with salt in it. If we had a dock plant or a wet spot in that hay, he advised us to put some salt on it. I remember the first horse-drawn side delivery rake that I ever saw. I remember the first hay press. Now the first hay presses were actually in two-story buildings. Most of them were right along the river. They made bales 200 to 300 pounds and transported up and down the river. And then they came to the portable hay press. We didn't have any of those in McHenry, but I've seen a lot of them operate in hay shows since I've been out on the job. My first experience, and I apologize for, for some of these slides being out of focus, but the, back in those days, we didn't have very good cameras. But my first experience with hay baling occurred when I was very young, very small boy. We had a stationary baler that a contractor would bring from farm to farm uh, throughout the haying season. He would pull that in with the tractor, unhook it, scotch it up real good, stabilize it, turn the tractor around, put a big belt on the flywheel of the tractor, hook it to the flywheel of the baler, and we were ready to bale hay. There'd be a person up, up here funneling, getting hay into that, in the channel. And then we'd usually have two people back here, and this one has three. But wire blocks would be put between the bales. They'd have two slits in them. And wire would be slid through those slits. The wire would be slid through from this side. My job was on the far side, pulling that wire through, pushing it back through that block. And that's how we were baling hay back then. Now, the next development in this line was when a pickup attachment was attached to that baler. You can still see it's being run by a belt here, but a pickup attachment, but still no knotter. 
There was not a development of a knot that would hold on that bail. Now Appleby had developed a, do- a knotter for a hay bind, or for a, a combine, and it was very easy to get a knot to hold on a bundle of wheat straw. But it was much more difficult on that baler and that bale when you that bale kick start kicking on it, those knots would come down. Undone. So Ennis out in Iowa modified that knot and actually put it on a baler. But when they started to use it, about 50% of the knots were coming loose. So it never got commercialized. A major breakthrough occurred in the 30s. Not only a major breakthrough in the knot development, but a major breakthrough in hay, hay production. Basically, it happened on a, a farm in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. A man by the name of Ed Note, who was a brilliant individual. He was a Mennonite farmer there. He already had about 20 different patents. He took that knot that Ennis couldn't get to work. He modified that that knotter and got it to perform. Then he built a baler. Then he started baling hay on his farm. And the other neighbors wanted the baler. He actually made a couple more balers. But just down the road from Ed was a manufacturing company, farm machinery company, that was making farm machinery, and they needed a new product. They became very interested in Ed Nolte's baler. They contracted to get the marketing rights for that, and then they began to market the New Holland self-tie baler. And that baler, that little baler, changed haymaking history. Now, in high school, I worked on a lot of hay crews because there was always jobs during the haying season to haul in hay. We didn't have alfalfa in McHenry, but my first experience in seeing big fields of of alfalfa was when I was a freshman in high school. I was on the FFA judging team. We went to Owensboro to have a judging contest, and well, after we finished, the farmer took us on a tour, a wagon tour of the farm, and he had a lot of great alfalfa fields. And I got my first real feel for just how great that plant was. After I got out of high school, I went in the Army, and was training, was, it's in Germany. Spent two and a half years over there, and I got to travel throughout Europe, and I got to see a lot of farms. I got to see a lot of alfalfa, especially in Germany. There was a farm family near where we trained, and I got to know that farm family, and I went back and spent a leave with that family. While I was there, I found this picture the other day, and I wanted to put it in. I don't put that in to show my horse riding skills. I put that in to call your attention to this stack of hay right here. I hadn't paid much attention to that, but that stack of hay, 20 years after that picture was taken, Heston produced a Heston 30 stack hand that made a stack just like that here in the U.S. I got out of the Army and I came here to Bowling Green and Western Kentucky University. I spent a lot of time on the farm. At the time, Western had one of the top dairy herds in the state. And the ration for that dairy herd was corn silage and alfalfa. I spent a lot of time there and I had the chance to see that alfalfa from the start of the growing season through harvest. Now, I wasn't there working on alfalfa at the time, I actually did my master's thesis on weed science. I worked with the nodding thistle plant in a joint project between UK and Western. From Western, I went to the University of Missouri. I chose alfalfa as the plant that I would work with on my PhD. While I was there, I had a chance to meet some outstanding forage people. I met this individual. This individual, Dr. Hal Wheaton, was the extension forage specialist at the University of Missouri one of the top extension forage specialists in the country. He mentored me, took me under his wing, and took me to a lot of field days and a lot of, a lot of farm visits. He had a farm, I helped him haul in hay, helped him work his cattle. And during my last semester at Missouri, he invited me to go to Wisconsin with him. By the way, uh, Hal Wheaton just turned 100 years old this summer. And when he retired, Dr. Jimmy Henney uh, took the position at Missouri as extension forage specialist. But anyway, he invited me to go to Madison, Wisconsin, to the National Alfalfa Symposium because he wanted me to meet the absolute best of the best alfalfa research and teaching people in the U.S. While I was there, I met my heroes. I met people that I had been reading about. And two of the people that were there asked me to go to lunch with them. Literally scared me to death because these two people were my heroes. Warren Thompson from the University of Kentucky, and Dr. John Baylor from Pennsylvania. 
They took me to lunch and I was afraid I was going to drop a handful of mashed potatoes and embarrass myself or something. But they were very gracious. Their challenge that day was to convince me that I should come to Kentucky and take the forage extension position. Well, that was all well and good, but I hadn't been offered any positions in Kentucky. But the very next week, Dr. Jack Hyatt, department chair, invited me to Kentucky for a seminar and interview, and I came. I graduated from University of Missouri in May of 1974. Cheryl finished up her teaching job there. We loaded everything we had in a U-Haul truck, and we headed for Kentucky. I had accepted the position as Extension Forage Specialist at the University of Kentucky, and on the first day when I moved my first box into my office, a young lady met me at, at my office and said, I'll be your new secretary. That turned out to be a very historic day for me because that young lady was Christy Forsythe. She had just graduated, just got out of high school, and she had only been on the job two or three days, but she would be my secretary for 41 years. She would be more than just a secretary. She would be an advisor. Of all the 35 years that we did the Alpha Alpha Conference, she typed every single word of every proceeding, every letter, every request for an exhibitor. She knew the Alpha Alpha program in Kentucky better than I did. Christy's still working today. This is her 50th year uh, on the job. Dr. Curtis Absher was a beef cattle specialist at the time, and I, he mentored me. We traveled throughout the, the state doing field days and farm visits and programs. Ken Evans was the forage specialist in Lexington. When he retired, Dr. Jimmy Henning accepted that position. When Jimmy went into administration, Dr. Ray Smith came from Virginia in that position. Along with Tom Keene and others, I've been very fortunate to be a part of a great team of uh, forage extension people in Kentucky. When I joined the University of Kentucky, Kentucky had what I would consider the absolute best forage team in the country. You. Uh, I'll point to this screen here. This is Dr. Norman Taylor, uh, outstanding red clover breeder, uh, Ken Starr, Freedom, Kentucky Pride. Doc, Warren Thompson had just retired but was still actively involved. Dr. Tim Taylor developed the pasture renovator. He and Dr. Templeton did the stockpiling research. They did all of the groundbreaking research for pasture renovation. The gentleman on the right was the tall fescue breeder. Dr. Bob Buckner, he bred Ken High, Kenwell, Johnstone, and this gentleman right here with the tie, a true forage legend. He had retired, but I was still had a chance to work with him for about three years. He was a great mentor to me. When I got ready to retire, I found a folder in my files, and it had a group of handwritten notes that Dr. Fergus had written me. Now, Dr. Fergus, you'll remember him. He's the gentleman that that discovered tall fescue down in Menifee County in 1931. What you may not remember about him, he was a red clover breeder, and you've probably seeded Kenlin red clover. He's the one that bred that one. I got a chance over the years to work with a tremendous team of county agents. When I first arrived here, most county agents had grown up on a farm. They knew about farming. They had the farmer at heart. They also, many of them were veterans. Many of them were World War II. Many of them were Korean veterans. Uh, absolute top crop. Uh, there are some Ohio Countyans in the room. Recognize John Cavanaugh of uh, Ohio County, Tom Kurtzanger from Davis County, right in this county. Uh, that was an outstanding. Kelsey Driscoll was a county agent. Dennis, you'll remember in, in Logan County. Aubrey Warren, an outstanding county agents. So we had an outstanding group of county agents that were part of the team that helped move Alpha Alpha forward. We would not have been able to make strides with Alpha Alpha if it had not been for the cooperation of farmers throughout the state. And there's just a small group of, of them that, that we've had a chance to work with. Industry played a critical role in Alpha Alpha advancement in the last 50 years. Uh, industry representing seed and machinery and chemicals and, and many other things. Also, Warren Thompson told me early on in my career, if you don't involve media, you're not going to get your message out nearly as rapidly. And I took that to heart, and we tried to involve media and have them as a critical part of the Alpha Alpha team over all these years, and it worked effectively. Many organizations at the national and state level enhanced our abilities to promote and advance Alfalfa. 
national level include the American Forage and Grassland Council, the National Hay Association, and the National Alfalfa Groups. Statewide groups include the Kentucky Forage and Grassland Council, Kentucky Cattlemen, Kentucky Department of Agriculture, and Kentucky Farm Bureau played an extremely important role. We probably wouldn't have our variety testing today had it not been for the influence of the Kentucky Farm Bureau. When I started, our emphasis in forage research and extension was centered around tall fescue. Justifiably so, because tall fescue represents about five and a half million of the seven million acres of pasture and hay we have in Kentucky. A few years after I arrived, the Georgia folks identified that endophyte in tall fescue, and that opened a whole new world for research, extension, and opportunities for advancement on the farm. Throughout my career, the most important forage improvement practice in this state was pasture renovation. Following the uh, research by Templeton and Taylor, they found that if we could convert a stand of fescue, pasture, or hay from a straight stand of fescue into a fescue clover, we could improve the yield, improve the quality, and take advantage of those legumes to fix nitrogen. And we also, if we selected a deeper-rooted legume like alfalfa or red clover or lespedeza, we could have much better summer pasture. So that was, was and still continues to be a very effective program. Now, at the time I came in 1974, Ed Smith, one of our ag engineers, and Tim Taylor, one of our agronomists, had just developed a power till seeder. And they had worked with that. This was their initial re, uh, plots where they worked with. And then they needed somebody to field test that. And I was young and didn't have a whole lot going on, so they nominated me, and I had to accept. I drug a tractor and that renovator all over Kentucky, putting in hundreds of acres of pasture demonstrations. I did that for two years. And then John Deere bought the rights to that, and John Deere produced their first prototype, and I got that, the second one of those produced, and began to do that. While I was doing that, primarily working with red clover, I would always look for opportunities to put some, some alfalfa in and cut that, and that's why I did a lot with the paraquats and the, to, to suppress that competition. Meanwhile, the folks over in uh, Virginia had, had done a lot of research on no-till. We started seeing no-till uh, alfalfa come in. The big round bales came on in the 70s and they created an opportunity, especially for the beef cattle industry in the state. We're having difficulty getting labor to put up hay. This was a one person operation, but it came with a whole series of questions. The storage loss, feeding loss, how much did the bales weigh? All of those were initial questions that we had to deal with. My first month on the job, Warren Thompson lined up a tour for me to go out to the Willamette Valley of Oregon to study the seed production out there. It was a, a life-changing experience for me. I'd never seen anything like that. Most of the fescue, orchard grass, ryegrass, white clover, red clover, crimson clover that you grow, that we buy here, is produced in, in the Willamette Valley. I made my first visit in 1974 and I'm still working with that organization uh, today. Warren Thompson would make many visits early in my career to mentor me, to help me, and Warren was a great alfalfa man. You wouldn't be around Warren long that you weren't talking about alfalfa. He came to me one time and said a group had approached him to find someone to do some high yield alfalfa work. And uh, he told me what it would entail. So. Our soil specialist and I set up a, a three-year replicated trial. And at the time, we set that up and set, put it in at Princeton. And we had just hired a new technician, a recent graduate from Murray State University, and his name was Bill Talley. Bill Talley was an outstanding worker. He worked on that project for three years. At the end of the three years, he had produced 10.13 tons of dry matter per acre. That record was set then in replicated conditions without irrigation, and that record, to my knowledge, still stands today. That same year, I made my first trip down to Argentina. Made my trip down to Argentina to look at how they were grazing large acreages of, of alfalfa with beef cattle. They were grazing that, that 
acreage. They grazed alfalfa about eight months of the year and winter annuals about four months of the year, and they were averaging about 800 pounds of beef per acre. Now to contrast that, we were getting on tall fescue in Kentucky, we were doing well to get 100 pounds of beef per acre. So we felt like that grazing alfalfa had a role to play, and we began to work with that. Roy Burris was the beef cattle specialist. We put in a study uh, on grazing alfalfa. Now at a field day that summer, a group of county agents from this this area, Mammoth Cave area primarily, came to me and asked me to start teaching, consider teaching a graduate level course in alfalfa production. Well, the reason that they were most interested is the UK had just set in another incentive to county agents to encourage them to get their master's. If they got a master's degree, they got, they got an increase in salary. So I set up an alfalfa course and I taught that course Jimmy Henning came on the following year, and then he and I alternated between alfalfa and a forage course between Lexington and there. In my very first class, I had two students in the class that were very interested in the alfalfa after I'd shown them the, the slides from down in Argentina and took them out, showed them our plots. Two of those students, this gentleman right here is Ken Johnson. He was the NRCS agent in Monroe County at the time. And the, the, this one was the Steve Osborne was the county agent. They asked me about doing a research project on, on a farm in Monroe County. And I said, I think it's a great idea. They set up a replicated study on that farm. And as a result, they produced 1,354 pounds of beef per acre. To that date, that was a record. To my knowledge, that record still stands. I want to call your attention on page 49 in your proceedings, there is an error. It says in there 1,054 and it should be 1,354. So if you'd correct that, I'd appreciate it. The Kentucky Alfalfa Conference, the conference that we're at now, began with a farm visit in Shelby County, Kentucky in 1980. I went to look at some alfalfa fields at the request of the county agent Roy Catlett. We visited several fields. I had a farmer friend with me from Lincoln County. He was president of the Kentucky Forage Council. He was also chairman of the Farm Bureau Forage Commodity Committee. He was with me on that program and we went and we had good discussion and what turned into a request for just a county meeting at night came in to the very first alfalfa conference. We taught that in two locations in 1981 and then for the next 35 years, we, I chaired that and we put together an alfalfa conference. That conference was combined with the national conference two different years that we're, we were doing that. The, al, the alfalfa intensive training seminar grew out of that when the certified alfalfa seed council said put a training together on a short course basis at the national level. So they let me choose my committee and I chose some outstanding alfalfa people and we put together a three day practical program from seed to feed and beyond and we taught that. We taught the first one in Louisville, Kentucky in 1993 and then I chaired 37 of those before I retired and there's people in this room that's graduated from that. In fact, there's one person in this room that not only graduated from the alfalfa seminar, but we started teaching an advanced seminar, and he graduated from that. And that's our first speaker this morning, John Russell. Now, what all's happened since 1974? Well, we've had tremendous amounts of change. I just want to hit a few high points as we go through. When I first started making my visits to farms in 1974, and asking what variety of alfalfa are you growing? Almost invariably the variety was buffalo, if it was known. The second most popular was vernal. In this 2024, Gene Olson will have over 30 different varieties in his variety trials. There was over 161 varieties at the national level. In 1974, there were over 15 universities breeding alfalfa. Now there's basically no breeding programs going on at the alfalfa, in the alfalfa. But in the industry, there were a lot of companies just getting started in the 70s. This gentleman here to my left, uh, 
Don Miller. Dr. Don Miller is the only alfalfa breeder that started with me in 1974 that's still breeding alfalfa today. We were together down in Mobile, Alabama last month, and we had a lot of time to talk and reminisce about the past. He shared this information uh, with me. If you look at all of those companies in black there, those have been major players in the alfalfa industry over the last 50 years. But if you think about it, well, for example, FFR, they supplied essentially all of the southern states varieties that many have, have planted. NAPB, remember Apollo and Vanguard and all of those, they did that. Now, none of these companies exist. We basically have three, and then with Mountain View, one other, that's supplying and breeding the genetics that we have today. In 1974, the average yield was 2.8 tons per acre. Last year, the average yield was 3.6 tons per acre. But I think, and Dennis made a point on this this morning and others, that it's very difficult for us in any field to make a lot of money working on averages. Let's look at three things. Let's look at the average yield of alfalfa, 3.6. But then let's look, we know the, the record over here is over 10 tons, but let's look at the people in this room today. You're producing five to eight tons of alfalfa and you're doing a good job. And that's what we need to do is, is need to push that up because yield drives profit. When I started, essentially all the seed was raw seed. We, we inoculated it just before we seeded. Now a very high percent of the seed that we buy is coated pre-inoculate it, and also can have a whole bunch of other stuff incorporated in there if we can show through, through good scientific results that it's economically feasible. When I was working in McHenry, Kentucky and growing up, we had two fertilizers. We had manure and we had 10-10-10. Now today you can get about any grade of fertilizer you want. You can get micronutrients. Our big changes is how we, how we apply it. We have variable rate fertility. We have, uh, we can put on foliar applications. My papa seeded everything he seeded on forages with a horn seeder. Now this is a store-bought horn seeder there. My papa's was a burlap bag and a horn that where he had dehorned one of the one of the animals, and that was his horn seeder. When I started in '74, essentially all the alfalfa was seeded in a prepared seed bed with a brilliant cedar or a simulated brilliant cedar. Now we have all different kinds of no-till drills and air seeders and many other things for seeding, but in a prepared seed bed, I still don't think there's anything better than the brilliant cedar. Insects, disease, and weeds rob us each year of profit, but we've come a long way in the last 50 years. We haven't made a lot of progress with insects on, on genetics but we have made a lot of progress in having some outstanding insecticides that are very effective and, and uh, environmentally friendly. Diseases, when we, in 50 years ago, we were worried with bacterial wilts and rot, root rots and things. We don't worry about those anymore. Now we still have some diseases that we need to make progress on. My biggest frustration in pest management throughout my career was in weed control. While we've had a lot of herbicides over the years, We've had our challenges of getting everything to work with the plant at the right stage and the weather at the right. But the biggest breakthrough in my career has been Roundup Ready Alfalfa. That's permitted us to have as clean of alfalfa as we want. Now, if you think about it, we've come from the, my papaw that I saw him cutting with a sigh. Then we had uh, horse-drawn mowing machines, tractor-drawn mowing machines. Then we had a major breakthrough in alfalfa quality production. That is when crippers and crushers and conditioners came on. These devices were made to do things to that stem and manipulate that stem so that it would dry at a more even rate with the leaves and that permitted us to put up a higher quality a whole lot quicker. Now we have, as John pointed us out this morning, we have outstanding cutting machines. We have more conditions that will do a great job cutting a large amount of alfalfa in a short period of time and doing it very efficiently. Started with raking hay with a pitchfork and then buck rates came along. We never had one of these, but when I first started my career, worked in Owensboro, Davis County a lot. There was a gentleman over there by the name of Powtan Hawes. He still used a buck rake, and he would bug me on, on any, uh, any field day that I had, and, and I finally featured his buck rake at a field day one time, even though I've never, never used it myself. 
I've used the dump rake, the side delivery rake. Now we have all different kinds and colors and sizes of raking devices that will do a great job. We, we've got windrow inverters and tedders. We've got mergers. And then John talked to us this morning about the fluffing machines. We, we've gone from, from putting hay up in a shock to putting loose hay up to hay presses. We've gone through the, the advent of Ed Note and New Holland and that little square baler. Now we can put up hay any size bales that we want to, any size square bales. And we saw, John, new balers coming out all the time. I was at the National Beef Cattle Association down in Orlando last week, and Case IH had their new automated baler there. New Holland had their new big yellow round baler. You'll see a lot of these advances when you go to the Farm Machinery Show next week, and uh, these high-capacity balers and the double tie that John talked about. We've gone from a little round baler, a little round AC bale that we could leave in the field, all the way to the big square bales, which really helped a lot of beef cattle producers in the state of Kentucky stay in business. And we also have seen stackers come along, two of them, that Heston put out. They became popular in the West, but not here in Kentucky because of, of a number of conditions. The one thing that made the greatest progress in my career that permitted us to put up a higher quality product and save that, especially in our spring cut, was baleage. Uh, we also do a lot, and John them know more about this, a lot of exports. We now can put alfalfa in pellets, cubes, we can compress it, we can band it, we can put it in can containers and ship it literally all over the world. We now have grazing tolerant alfalfa varieties that we can do a much better job grazing. We know more about bloat management than we ever have. We still don't have a bloat safe alfalfa, but we have it. Now, let's look at a little bit of, of progress. My papa used to think if he could get two shocks a day, that was a good day for him. When I was hauling hay for some of the farms around McHenry, we'd be hauling a long way to the barn. We'd have very small fields. And if we got 200 bales a day, we felt like we were doing pretty good. At that same time, right here in this county, a person that had more modern equipment Donald Baldock's in the back of the room here, but he could have one baler and four wagons, and his goal was to get 600 bales a day up. Clayton Geralds and his crew in Hart County raked, baled, hauled to the barn 10,545 bales in one day. And if we think about the capacity we have with the big bales, Big round bales and big square bales, we can get 20 to 45 bales per, per hour. The big new case ice that I saw last week talking about 65 uh, bales per hour. So we have that capacity. We have drying equipment now that can dry little square bales. This is actually John Russell's machine right here. We can dry the, the big square bales. We can dry the big round bales. We have that capabilities. We can bundle hay. We can bundle that up so we can get more on a truck and reduce the trucking cost. We could got equipment that we can handle every bale without even touching it unless we have some kind of a problem. Those have all been advances. Testing, Jimmy can take a sample of that hay, take it over to Kim's van, and just about have a sample instantly. When I first started, I would take a sample, take it back in, I'd dry it and grind it, then I'd send it to A&L Labs, and depending on how backed up they were, I might get that back and it'd be about a month from the time I took the sample to get it back. Now we can get it instant, get it faxed back to you. Then you can fax that or you can email it or text it to a client and you can compare notes on it. Marketing, when I first started, marketing was basically word of mouth. You got some hay for sale, I got a few bales this year. Or the more sophisticated marketing approach is you put a little tag on the feed mill bulletin board or you put a sign on the post in the yard. That was marketing back then. And think what we can do now. We can instantly fax that down and the person knows exactly the quality of that hay. But then if they say, I'd like to see it, you can just FaceTime them and show them all the detail about that. You can do internet marketing. We just heard about a lot of marketing strategies a little bit earlier. We also have a lot of things that impact Kentucky that we're not necessarily involved in. International marketing that can impact 
of the future of what we do here in Kentucky. The National Hay Association, the oldest organization that I work with, does a great job on looking at that marketing and international marketing and monitoring that. And we're extremely fortunate here today because we have the past two presidents of that organization with us today, Clayton Geralds and John Russell, the two past presidents of the National Hay. If you're going to the state to the Farm Machinery Show next week, stop by their booth. They'll have a lot of good hay producers that you can talk to there. The biggest change in alfalfa production in the last 50 years has been in, in technology and communication. To contrast that, when I grew up, I was a teenager before uh, we had electricity. All the light in our house at night prior to that were from those cool oil lamps. I never had a telephone growing up. My papa had a phone just about like that one right there. Now to contrast that, a few years ago, Cheryl and I were on a cruise ship. We were somewhere in the Atlantic, and if you use the, the internet uh, on the ship, you can FaceTime, and it won't cost anything. My granddaughter called me, FaceTime. I was sitting on, on the, the balcony, taking a glass of tea and looking at that vast ocean. And my granddaughter was in Versailles, Kentucky, walking her dog. I could see her, she could see me. And she said, here, Papa, I'll say hello to Benji. So I'm sitting in the middle of the Atlantic saying, talking to a dog in Versailles, Kentucky. <laughs> That's how modern technology is. And you think about all the things that we could do. For 35 years, I was the first speaker on this program. I could put every speech I ever gave at any alfalfa conference on that little bitty thumb drive. Basically, we can take that iPhone, you can get the market, you can get the weather, and you can get about anything you need to know, and you can communicate worldwide. Some of you can do it with a watch. I haven't got that. One of my biggest challenges in making farm visits throughout my career is walking down through that field with a farmer, and they say, what's that weed? What's that insect? What's that disease? And my pat answer was, I don't know, but I'll see if I can find out. Now, if I, I could be a pretty good specialist now. I could walk down through there, and if they asked me, I'd say, wait a minute, I could pull out my phone, and I'd have a phone out for there on weed ID, and I could identify it. Well, but he had already, or she had already identified it before I got there, so they probably wouldn't ask that. So we can do all that. I work a lot of exhibits at shows, as I will next week at the Farm Machinery Show. Ten years ago, people started saying, we don't want to take all these publications. We want your website. So we developed a website. Then they said, no, we want it all on a CD or a thumb drive. So we developed that. Then started in the last three or four years, they said, no, we want it on your QR code. So last week in NCBA, we introduced the QR code. Every publication that Don Ball and I have written for all the organ seed industry is on that barcode. That's how far we can. On the back of your publication, you have a barcode that you can scan gobs of information. Now, I was uh, in uh, Orlando last week and went to a seminar, and I'm amazed the technology is just in drones, and that's all I'm having time to do. They have drones, spray drones now, that have the precision down to one quarter of an inch. They have spray drones now that can spray 40 acres plus an hour. From a livestock standpoint, they can send one of those drones over a herd of cattle real quietly or over a, over a feedlot, and they've got thermal sensors on them. They can find an animal that's got a low-grade fever before you've got a downer cow out there. It's amazing what all that can be, be done on that, and we're just scratching the surface. We've come a long way in the last 50 years. There's been more progress in alfalfa production from 1974 to 2024 than there was from Genesis 1-1 to 1974. And we think about how fast technology is developing. What's going to happen in the next decade? We've got just a little glimpse of some possibilities with equipment and, and with marketing today, but just imagine what that, that's going to be. In 2002, we broke a record in Kentucky. Our cash receipt from ag culture was $8.3 billion. Now, if you just have a multiplier effect of a very conservative five, that's over $45 billion that the ag culture industry is worth in the state. How does that contrast to 1974? We had 2.1 billion then. 
So we, we've come a long way. Now, what about the future? I'm out of time, so I'm, gonna, I'm glad because I, can't, I don't know much. I feel like Yogi Bear. He said it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Peter Drucker said, the only thing we know about the future is that it will be different. Now, my papa was a very wise man. You can tell by how many times I've referenced him today that I idolized that man. But I would ask him as a young boy about the future, and uh, my papa would, would tell me. But he had one statement that he would make repeatedly about the future. It wasn't original with papa, but he quoted it to me enough that I'm going to give him credit for it today. Papa would always say, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And the wisdom of Papa is more meaningful to me uh, every day. So as we look at Kentucky Alfalfa, I believe that Alfalfa has a very bright future in Kentucky's overall ag culture. I believe that for two major reasons. I've worked with Alfalfa for over 50 years. Every year I've worked with that plant, I respect it more. It is truly the queen of the forage plants, and it has a lot to offer. So I, I believe it for that reason. The second thing, I believe it for the people in this room today. You have made, you are making, and you will make a difference in the future of alfalfa in Kentucky. And I wish you the absolute best. I predict this year is going to be the best growing season we've had for alfalfa in my lifetime. I was hoping somebody would shake their head on that. <laughs> We've got to be optimistic, folks. Thank you so much, and I think I've used my time right. <laughs>